We're a mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, and energy service company. We've been in business for 60 years. I've been in the hospital business probably 20 years. I've come to know TLC, and I continue to use these guys practically on every job that we, we have here at the hospital. This was a very unique and special project, just being able to be handed the keys and, and design the best of the best. First of all, we specify the equipment and size the equipment, and then we go to our vendor, which is Square D. They're known throughout the healthcare industry as the Econ Unparalleled piece of the equipment for gear. Schneider is a very important partner with us. There's great value in the products and also the people. Hello, thank you for joining today's 2017 National Electrical Code Impact to Electrical Design broadcast, sponsored by Schneider Electric and its affiliated brands. Before we begin, I'd like to review the desktop and the tools to use throughout the broadcast so that you can interact with us. At the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. We do capture all questions. A copy of today's slide deck and additional materials are available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Our moderator today is Wendell Leisinger. Wendell is a segment manager with an exclusive focus on consulting engineers, their design processes, regulatory requirements, and the impact of disruptive technologies. He has over 30 years of experience in the construction industry and is a thought leader on building information modeling. Now I will turn it over to our esteemed host and moderator. Wendell, you have the floor. Hello, I'm Wendell Leising, the Consulting Engineer Segment Manager for Schneider Electric. Thank you for joining our first live Expert to Expert broadcast in 2017. Many of you are familiar with our Expert to Expert series, which we host monthly webinars. And for those that aren't familiar, welcome and we hope to see you come back in the future. Please send in your questions and comments through the text. I will be monitoring that. And finally, as a result of this broadcast, we are offering PDH credit. During today's broadcast, we'll be addressing the critical changes in the National Electric Code that are impacting the professional engineer, engineer you. Particularly, we wanna discuss the new requirements and potential impact on engineering designs and your, and your projects. And also, we want to talk about the spirit of the code versus the letter of the code. We'll talk more about that during the panel discussion. But before we dive right in to the key changes, I think it's important that we hear from Amar Paul, Schneider Electric Senior Vice President for U.S. Business Operations, about what the trends are impacting the industry today and their influence on design and how Schneider Electric is supporting you, the specifier community. With that, I'll turn it over to Amar. Thanks, Wendell. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for this webcast. Talking to the consultant community is a big part of how we engage in a dialogue about where the technology trends are going. We know this is critical for you, for your professional status, but also for the advice and input you give your customers. So we really do appreciate you investing the time. We're going to talk about the National Electric Code and the changes. But before we go into that, I want to spend some time talking about our broader view in terms of how we see the world evolving. Our view at Schneider Electric is the world is going to be more digital, more decarbonized, and more decentralized. And as that happens, we think there's going to be an incredible focus on automation. We've been investing for a long time now to create sensing capability at every level. We talk about innovation at every level, and what that means for us is we start with a baseline of connected products. More and more of our products are going to communicate, have embedded metering, and have the ability to capture data. We then take that data and go to a middle layer for edge control where we can display that information. 
Then we're going to capture all that data with our customer support and aggregate it in the cloud and provide a layer of apps and analytics that even give best practice information back. So a three-tier architecture, starting with connected products, because the IoT world requires things, edge analytics that allow for rapid implementation of on-time, on-premise solutions, and then a layer of apps and analytics at the top that really allow you to analyze and compare your operation to best practice. This whole technology stack is what we refer to as ecostructure. We have solutions for buildings, for infrastructure environments, for industry, for data centers, and there's a lot more that we'd like you to learn about the solution so you can help your customers get the most out of what they do every day. And at Schneider Electric, we call that Life is On. The Specifier community has always played a critical role in the value chain. You help customers not only make the best choice to build the most efficient, sustainable facilities, but also balance the injection of technology with the most practical value engineering. We think this is a critical role in service, and it's important that we help you keep up with the latest changes in code. Today, we're going to talk about changes in the ARC energy reduction requirements, proper applications of new products, selective studies, and also how the tools and capabilities Schneider Electric is bringing can help you be more efficient for your customers. When you think about the role of a consulting engineer, the idea is critical to keep up with the latest technology, but also to have practical and high velocity responses. We understand this need. And to help you, we have invested a lot in creating a digital engagement model. We call this solution Expert Access. And with Expert Access, you can get access to people who have worked on these solutions for a long time. A little bit like the Mayday button. You can just press a button and get chat access to an expert who's a level three expert who can answer your question in real time. So the speed of your work is just real time. Secondly, we've offered you Layout Fast, which is one of the only solutions in the industry that natively integrates into Rivet. And so as you focus on building information management, your workflow is seamless and you can get real-time, accurate information through the Rivet application. And then finally, we also have the ability to give you access to our experts on the phone so you can have a direct conversation, get the questions you need answered, along with our web tools and product information. All of this is designed to do three things. Make sure you have the best information available to you. Make sure you get it when you need it so you can answer your customers' questions. And make sure that you get it on the terms that make sense for you. We'll be investing in making many of these solutions even more mobile than they are today. So make sure that you keep tracking. And the best way to know everything Schneider Electric is doing for consulting engineers is to become a member of our community. At the Schneider Electric portal for consulting engineers, all this information, as well as our training programs, our courses, our webinar schedules, are available. You can also go back to it as a repository of all our codes and standards information, so you can spend time learning at your own pace and for the different skill levels within your organization. The market is changing continually. In fact, the pace of change is becoming exponential. More and more things are getting connected, and applications are interfacing where historically they didn't. The building management system is talking to the electrical system. Security access is now playing a role, not just to ensure that the right people are where they're supposed to be, but helping bring people and products together in ways we hadn't imagined before. It's an exciting time, but it's also a time where the pace of change requires education to be a constant. Not something you do when you have time, but, but actually in real time. We're committed to that principle, and we're going to ensure that you have the resources you need through the Schneider Electric Portal, and whether it's the NEC changes that we'll talk about or the ongoing evolution of your business, we're here committed as part of this community to help you build the best, most cost-effective, most connected solutions for your customers. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Wendell. Thanks, Amr. You will hear more about our echo system, our echo structure technology and expert-to-expert -expert support and our layout fast investments. Now let's dive into today's topic, the National Electric Code. With me today here in Nashville are several esteemed colleagues who are very well versed in the code. First, Alan Manchi. He is the Vice President of External Affairs for Schneider Electric. He currently serves in a number of NFPA technical committees, including Code Making Panel 2 and 10. Welcome, Alan. Chad. Chad Kennedy is Manager of Industry Standards for Power Equipment at Schneider Electric. He's currently serving on Code Making Panel 13. Welcome, Chad. Thanks. And Jim Degan. 
He is a principal at Stantex Electrical Engineering Practice and has nearly 40 years of experience in the, de in the design of electrical systems. Jim is a member of Code Making Panel 13 and the Washington State Energy Code. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, gentlemen. It will be noted that with the 2017 National Electric Code changes, several articles were revised and there are new additions to the code. Today, we're primarily only focused on those articles that we believe that the electrical engineers need to pay attention to. The first three articles that we're going to talk about will address arc flash and arc flash energy reduction. Chad, do you want to start us off with Article 110? Oh, glad to, Wendell. Uh, when we look at the 110.16, where we have our general requirements for arc flash hazard marking on electrical equipment, the general requirements for field or factory marking was removed into a new paren A. A new paren B, however, includes requirements for service equipment 1200 amps or greater and now requires you to have the available fault current marked as well as the clearing time of the overcurrent protective device, whether that's a fuse or a circuit breaker, at that available uh, fault current. So when we look at this, it may appear straightforward. It may be simply that you use an infinite bus calculation and a transformer value to determine a theoretical maximum available fault current, or maybe you get a value from the utility. Um, and you use the time current curves for the overcurrent protected device, again, a fuse or a circuit breaker, to find a clearing time. And you use that data to create this label. Now on the surface, that really seems as simple as, as, as straightforward as you can have. But I think when we think about this, there are deeper levels that might need to be considered. Any thoughts? Oh, you bet. There's uh, lots of things to be thinking about, especially in talking with the utility. It's quite possible that they could have multiple sizes of transformers, one for the normal conditions and then another one that could be larger or smaller if that normal transformer fails. Uh, so your arc flash could vary uh, on a number of different perspectives with that fault current. Another consideration to be thinking about is the uh, arc arm switches for uh, arc flash reduction. Um, if that switch is on or off, it can affect the, uh, the arc flash current level, level, and that might require one or two labels at the switch gear. I think we, all, we, we generally find ourselves right looking for that available fault current from the utility in order to understand if uh, we can size the equipment right, correct? And I mean, we, we we're generally used to doing that. In this case, when we're talking about looking at the, an arc flash hazard, we really need to get to the real number. So ultimately, uh, needing to get to the utility, ask them what that actual number is so that we can understand that number would ultimately be used for doing our, our arc available arcing fault current, right, in a, in a study situation. So in this particular instance, we're looking at that available fault current, the code requires us to mark the clearing time based on the curve of the overcurrent device based on that real fault current, not necessarily uh, what might be available from the transformer uh, that's given, right, that could be changed out. Uh, so there's a date requirement there that, that helps establish when that marking was put in place. But I also believe that we could ultimately uh, talk maybe a little bit about the exception because that might be uh, where this ultimately goes with regard to needing to, to do the study in accordance with the, a 70E uh, perspective and, and the exception allows us to do that. Well, Al and I agree. One of the things to point out and the reason why the available fault current is so important is that overcurrent devices trip faster or clearing times will be shorter when the overcurrent protection operates faster. And a maximum available fault current would give you a quicker opening time or clearing time for that overcurrent protective device, whether it's a fuse or a circuit breaker. So that's why your incident energy is dependent upon having a, a value that's realistic mm -hmm. and, and really the available fault current. Um, Jim mentioned a key point here with the arc energy reduction methods. There's some overlap here with Article 240. And when you look at this overlap, um, you have a choice to make, whether you use the time current curves with the arc energy reduction method engaged, or are you, it, particularly if that's a manual engagement method, do you say, well, the protection of employees, that may not be engaged, or they may have forgotten to engage that. Um, so maybe I need two sets of information mm -hmm. on the equipment. Right. Engineers will want to work with their uh, clients to find out what, uh, what the client has as a work plan for 
uh, working on energized equipment, mm -hmm. and that will relate to this labeling and any personal protective equipment that uh, the client's employees would be required to wear when accessing the live, live equipment. Another point to consider is that when we look at um, the available fault current and this marking on the service equipment, there are zones of protection here, right? right? So if you, most electrical equipment has not been evaluated for any type of internal arcing fault, and an internal arcing fault within the service equipment can propagate from the load side to the line side, and therefore any clearing time benefit that this method would imply could be invalid. So you see some designs to the, today where they separate the service equipment uh, main overcurrent protective device from the distribution just to address that issue. Now, Alan, you mentioned the exception here, and the exception is certainly a plausible way of meeting the requirement. There are two specific methods in NFPA 70E uh, for, for applying an arc flash hazard analysis marking, whether that's PPE or incident energy levels the table method or an arc flash energy calculation. And again, you want to know the arc, uh, cur arcing current and the clearing time at that arcing current in those calculations. So you have, again, the same choice to make. Do I incorporate and use the time current curves based on arc energy reduction method? Or if that's a manually engaged method, do I need to include two sets of information for when that's engaged and when it's not engaged? Right. And so. So right in this one here, there's there's a there's a straight up there's a straight up requirement here. But I think you know the, the discussion or the or the things that the consulting engineer needs to think about is what information am I leaving behind, right? I mean, with regard to this, because we're leaving behind the available fault current and the clearing time of that overcurrent device under a heading of an arc flash hazard, and and that information may not provide the exact information that's needed to address that hazard, right? So we have a code requirement, we have sort of an intent here that we need to think through and, and plausibly the, the idea may be to move toward that exception because the consulting engineer typically has a lot of those tools to do those, to mm -hmm. do those calculations and understand those things. So that may be the path that, that this, to, to comply with this one that begins yeah, to unfold. That, I think that would be the easiest way to get through this one. Um, we're seeing uh, arc flash energy calculations and actually delivering the labels as a normal part of our services now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Wow. The first slide generated a lot of information and interest. However, could we uh, maybe talk a little bit, Jim, about the newest addition to the 2000 or to the National Electric Code around 24067? Well, sure. Uh, 24067 is uh, arc flash or arc energy reduction for fuse switches, and this is a natural follow-on to the requirement that's been in 24087 for circuit breakers for two code cycles now. Uh, certainly if you need it for circuit breakers, you're gonna need it for fuse switches. One of the, uh, the issues are different though because uh, the fuse switch doesn't have the automated operation. It might require some special tripping coils or uh, some relay sensing or other modifications. And, and to allow the manufacturer some time to adapt uh, their equipment to this requirement, this code uh, item is not going into effect until uh, January uh, 1st in 2020. Right, and as we look at this requirement, it, it was moved to point toward the fuse because the fuse is the overcurrent device in the fusible switch. So there is an allowance here if the fuse can open in 0.07 seconds. So there's a sort of an overlap there with the breaker and the breaker methods that I think it's important to point out. But you're right, where you fall out of that window, now you're talking about some type of quick opening of the switch or something else that helps the switch open in time, mm -hmm. so yes. Very good to know. With that, Alan, 24087 has been in the several versions of the code. What's changed? What's, what's new in the 2017? So 24087, maybe from a quick historical perspective, right, is that we saw, uh, we, we saw the code requirement go in for where breakers didn't have an instantaneous function. That was the first aspect of the code revision. Well, most of modern day, modern day uh, circuit breakers have that function, so may have not had a big implication with regard to the first time it was in the code. Uh, in the, in the code. The second time we came around and we actually implemented a reduction requirement, right? So in the 2014 NEC, we actually have 
uh, a, a list of, of items, right? There's four items and then there's an equivalent means that can be, that can be used there. And so people begin to understand this equivalent means and, and looking at the, the instantaneous aspects, aspects of the breaker. Well, why can't just the instantaneous aspect uh, that's incorporated in the breaker serve this function? And so that became a debate and a dialogue and, and being used in that equivalent means. So this code cycle, we've introduced that language to say the instantaneous trip or the instantaneous override that's built into the breaker can serve that function. So, right, what are we doing? We're calculating, uh, we have a performance requirement though now in this part of the, in, in these new requirements where we have to actually do the calculation for the available arcing fault current. So we actually have to find that arcing fault current and make sure that that instantaneous level of the overcurrent device will pick up that, uh, that particular arcing fault current level. And so there's some performance requirements that have to be done, but if you do your homework, right, we do your homework, we may be able to apply the overcurrent device as it sits without any other relays, without any other optics, without other types of, of uh, uh, reduction maintenance means to be put on there. Now, keep in mind, um, keep in mind that this wasn't intended for the instantaneous to be moved up and down with regard to doing maintenance, okay? Uh, that's really what that uh, reduction maintenance switch does, right? When we, when we engage it, it drops it lower, we turn it back, uh, we, we disengage it, and it brings it back to a level for the, for the consulting engineers who have set the coordination studies, right, and, and established where all those settings need to be placed. And we don't want to put the, the performance of the building in question by moving that up and down when we're doing maintenance on, on things, right? We could put a, a hospital or something at risk uh, by, by doing some of that. Uh, I do recognize that there are some industrials that I think do that as part of their uh, overall work safety work practices that, that have that as pre-existing capabilities that they could go in and do that. But that's not the intent of this particular requirement. This particular requirement was, was to be used in areas like, I'll give you a quick example, uh, multifamily, right? Multifamily uh, installation where I have a 1600 amp main feeding a number of apartments or, or other types of uh, small occupancies. And maybe we could actually set that instantaneous, uh, comes from the factory, right? Set right. at its minimum. And so a lot of people probably don't even realize that and it's setting there at its minimum. And as long as they do the calculation to understand that that arcing fault current is above that instantaneous level, there's really no additional work that, there are no additional equipment that needs to be uh, integrated as a part of this requirement. So, uh, you know, from a consulting engineer, be aware of this one because Right, you have to think about: Am I bidding against another, uh, you know, another another person with regard to that might apply this? And, and you didn't do your homework to do that calculation, right? So, uh, I think the consultant needs to be aware of all these tools and all of these particular requirements to make sure that they, re, you know, retain their competitiveness uh, with regard to these areas. Yeah, I, I think it's going to require some engineering judgment in its application. Certainly, if you look at the uh, wording in the code, you could almost say that you know, this does let me dial down, but I'm sure that that was not the intent of code making panel two to, to permit uh, somebody to come in there and play with that dial um, and restoring it to uh, whatever level it was supposed to be set at originally can't be done by dialing back. I mean, that should be tested and, and to assure the performance that was engineered is going to be achieved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it does address a key approval though because in the 2014 NEC these installations fell under this sort of nebulous approved equivalent means and this code changes to allow instantaneous really sort of close that gap. Provides the recognition right for right. it to be used absolutely. Yeah. Nice discussion on arc flash uh, as, as it's evolving and continues to evolve. With that Jim would you like to update us on 210? Yeah, sure. There's some new requirements for the uh, GFCI uh, protection of, uh, of receptacles. They've expanded it to uh, single phase re receptacles up to 50 amps and uh, three phase receptacles up to 100 amps. And I think code making panel two recognized that, uh, that there's a lot of people that uh, might be using these receptacles that aren't necessarily electricians or, or electrically qualified personnel and that the added GFCI will offer them some protection. Uh, certainly though, the, there's some challenges in implicating this. We're all used to being able to specify uh, GFCI protection as part of the circuit breaker or overcurrent protective device. When you get up into uh, ratings of uh, 100 amps and three phase, uh, manufacturers, you know, they'll offer 
ground fault equipment protection on those breakers, but not ground fault circuit interruption. So there's a challenge here. And I think that challenge can be met in the marketplace now by certain sensitive relays, but applying those to your projects is going to require consideration of you know, some control power and uh, shunt trips. And, and so uh, this one's going to uh, need some uh, attention to work out uh, actually how it's implemented. I mean, we have a number, a number of applications here, right, with regard to restaurants, uh, right, that are, that are using the quick connects uh, and receptacle, in, in essence, right, to move those commercial mixers around. They have compressors on them like, a, you know, like a, an ice cream machine or something, right? I mean, from fast food to, to, to any kind of uh, uh, restaurant or, or food preparation areas in those kitchens, right? So as we remember, 2108B, even though we move to those higher amperages, right, we still have the list of, of locations. locations, right? So we still have to look through those locations and go outdoors, uh, uh, the kitchen, right? And, and so you start looking through that list and uh, you have to think, right, as a consulting engineer, what is it that ultimately applies here? It's not every receptacle, but you have to look at that location and then begin to understand where do I apply this? Where do I have to apply it in order to, to be compliant with, with the 210A B, okay? Mm -hmm. Right, and there's a couple of applications such as the outdoor pin and sleeve connections for safety switches that might be one of those that sort of falls through the cracks. You don't think of that typically, but that would fall into this as well. Right. If right. you're 150 volts to ground or, le or less, then it would fall. So 208Y120 would fall Phones. into this. Interesting discussion around products, whether it's arc flash or GFCIs. Let's switch gears a little bit, and Alan, share with us your insight in this next example around lighting loads for specific occupancies. So in 220, uh, 220 is our, is our area of the code where we do electrical calculations, right? So we run the calculations out uh, in, in accordance with 220. 220.12 specifically addresses the lighting. Uh, requirements in the building. And so as we look at the table, you look at the occupancy, you calculate your lighting loads based on uh, a VA per square foot. So right, that could be two and a half, three and a half, whatever the number is that's been established for what the right, right lighting load would be in that building. And so what we've continued to see is, is a little bit of pressure right from that calculation that uh, the consulting engineers often have to do the calculation of not only the NEC for the electrical inspector, but also the energy code side of it, right? To demonstrate that you're, you're complying with that not more than a certain VA per square foot. So you look at those and you say, why is there uh, a differential here, right? And, and, and so a little bit of pressure to look at those numbers uh, where the where the uh, energy code has been adopted, and and now what we're, so what we're doing in this code change is actually for office spaces and for banks. Uh, there's an exception that's been put in. So those spaces where at three and a half VA per square foot can now be calculated at two and a half VA per square foot. So that gives us gives you some latitude in your calculations and may drop you know could drop you in a, in a large space that's a bank or a large office space uh, could could drop. Uh, the, the, the calculation enough to move you into maybe a smaller, a, a smaller service or something, right? So once again, as the consultants are, are looking at, uh, you know, bidding and understanding, they need to know these changes to make sure they're, 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 they're competitive against, against the others that may be uh, chasing these same jobs, right? So you got to use all the tools you have available to you. One of the other pieces of this that we need to talk about that's actually been in the code for a couple of cycles and hasn't, hasn't uh, I don't think has unfolded yet, is that there's an exception that says, if I put a, if I put a monitoring system on here using a, a VA meter, then I can ultimately move clear down to the energy code level. So for instance, if I had a bank at three and a half and that, that number in the energy code was one, I could actually put a monitoring system on and an alarm system that would tell me, that, that keeps track of that load in case people start adding lights and things to it, that I could actually drop that load significantly further. So uh, you start to see reasons and code requirements here where we're looking at connecting the building, right? I mean, you start about alarming, connecting, monitoring, and so you put these provisions in place and, and you have an opportunity to, to maybe even present your customer with, with utilizing things like uh, you know, ecostructure and some of those capabilities that actually gives them an advantage with regard to, to how they size the service and how they size the structure on the calculations. 
Yeah, I was going to echo that, Alan. If you just have a power monitoring system with alarms and you don't have it tied in, you need a process in place on what response will happen to the alarms. Who takes action? Who's responsible for that? How do you make sure that the infrastructure remains in a safe operating condition? Sure. Yeah. I think we're going to see this used a lot in engineering designs because uh, energy codes are becoming more prevalent across the country and those energy codes themselves have requirements for metering. So it's a natural uh, fit to take advantage of this exception. Mm, absolutely. Interesting. Let's go to a, some questions that are coming in. And oh boy, you guys are going to be busy this weekend filling out the questions. We have lots. Uh, here's one. Chad, you may like this one. Art Flash, is there a designated recalculation time? So there, there is not in the NEC. The label that was added in 11016B uh, has you record the date that the calculation was made and the equipment was marked. But if we look into NFPA 70E, there are guidelines there for, for recalculation and remarking. So if you go the exception route, we have some codes and standards that set that, le that level, that recalculation mm -hmm. time frame, but the NEC does not. Good, he continues. Should you use maximum size utility transformer for the bus board size? So we have a requirement in 11024, which is the maximum available fault current, and that is the value that you would use for sizing the equipment. So that's a perfectly valid way to size the equipment. Just don't use that value for your arc flash hazard analysis. So we may end up with two numbers in all this, and we have to keep those numbers straight, right? That's for where true. they yeah. get applied. Yes. Right. So let's complicate this just a little bit more because of the fact there's about three more questions coming in around when talking about maximum available fault current, do we not also have to consider motor contributions from the premise? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Jim, I'll let that. And uh, the, the considerations for that, though, are declining because a lot of the SCR-based drives are not uh, regenerative in, mm -hmm. in character. And so if you've got an energy code that requires you to put uh, variable speed drives in and the rest of the control, uh, those themselves aren't going to be pushing current back on. But you can get uh, solid state drives like elevators that do regenerate energy and that mm -hmm. must be taken into account in the fault current calculations. Needless to say, it's not easy. Oh, it gets more complicated all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Indeed. Let's go back to um, the testing around 230.95, Chad. Great, thanks, Wendell. So in 2.30, we're talking about electrical services. In 2.30.95 is where we've had our traditional ground fault protection of equipment requirements. You know, the requirement that you install ground fault protection of equipment to protect the equipment, it reduces the equipment damage for the most common fault within the power system, which is a ground fault. So that is done when the equipment is installed on site. So what's changed here in the 2017 is the test method. We used to have all sorts of test methods available to, available to us, such as push to test, uh, handheld and, and full function test kits that you could buy from manufacturers to provide this testing means. But the code now specifies primary current injection as the only testing method uh, allowed in this section. And that is sort of a big change, mm -hmm. right? Big change. There are a number of factors to consider. Um, one is that this will involve some planning and project expense as well. First, let's go through the basics of primary current injection. A high current injection testing equipment is connected on the line side of your overcurrent protective device at the service, whether that's a circuit breaker or a fusible switch. Uh, current is injected through the main power path or the main current path through the overcurrent device to the load side. And on the load side, Jumpers are installed, so there is a uh, test conditions for no tripping, such as load unbalance, and there are test conditions for tripping, which would simulate a ground fault. And this can be done at multiple levels. So if you've got a system that has two or more levels of ground fault protection in the system, uh, this can move and progress through. Uh, all the way down, and it's a it's a very it's a very nice test method. It works particularly well where you have multiple sources uh, interconnected, such as with a parallel generator bank and utilities in parallel. All of those type of configurations work well. There's some significant logistics hurdles to work out, though. Right. So I mean, yeah, I think there's, I think that's the part of the project management aspect of this, right? I mean, with regard to maybe not only the, the, the consulting engineer setting up, but also the, the contractor on site, right, setting up when does this get done? Because uh, obviously you don't want to have to 
to, to connect everything up and then remove the connections to do all of this testing, right? So setting that equipment, having the, the logistics of the test done uh, as it's set before we pull the wires and make those connections to the terminals uh, could be a significant time saver uh, with regard to the, the, the project. Yeah, engineers will need to take a look at their testing and performance specifications and uh, devise the best method to address this. It really means that as part of the commissioning effort that, that engineering involvement is essential because to verify the performance of a multiple levels of ground fault, how you're going to test that uh, can vary uh, and, and it just needs some attention. It, it does provide some benefits. It can certainly catch where you have current transformers that are, are have the polarity reversed, right? It can cer certainly catch those type of configurations. Uh, it can certainly address multiple sources where you want to have coordination between sources as well as levels within your system. So there are definitely benefits for this. This is a big change. It requires specialized test equipment, so you're going to need testing agencies. This is not the type of equipment that most electrical contractors will have available to them within their, their company. And, and I would say this will be one that right, the enforcement community picks up on really quick with regard to asking for the information and the documentation. That's so, correct. Uh, yeah, this I isn't so. one that This isn't probably yeah. one that slides through for a while. I think it's one that uh, you have to be right on top of, right? That's right. I'm glad you mentioned CT polarity. I think that's one of the trouble spots that we see most frequently out in the field. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's interesting, Jim, that you were talking about the commissioning, and, and Chad, you mentioned the fact that you need to do this primary injection before the contractor hooks it up. How do you balance that? You know, if you're in a commissioning mode, you've, you've got all the connections made. You're going to ask them to unconnect and hook up the primary testing? It's going to have to be part of that test plan, and, and you're going to want to look at, um, you know, what load is available to, to, to get the system operational and, and performance verification. And then if you're going to come back in and do the testing, it means disconnecting stuff. So. Uh, nobody's going to like doing that. <laughs> it's one of the largest challenges with this. So we, we move on to 312, which is our right. article for equipment and enclosures containing overcurrent protection devices. We have a new allowance in 312.8b, which really deals with how can we install power monitoring equipment within the equipment. This has been really sort of a code silent issue. And a lot of HJs in, in local municipalities across the country have sort of struggled with, do we allow CTs in the wiring space uh, when power monitoring is going to be installed? What, you know, what's acceptable here? So I think this is an important change because it aligns, it really sort of clarifies. We end up with two methods here that are allowed. The first is a listed accessory to the, the equipment manufacturer's product. So power monitoring can be installed in the field. It's supplied by the manufacturer. It's part of their equipment certification listing. The other choice here is have a listed kit. It's a standalone kit, can be used in anyone's product. Uh, and again, it just really clarifies and puts code compliance in a clear path for, for approval by the AHJ. And I mean, really, right, this is, this is tying back, right, to even that 220 topic that we, that we talked about, right? I mean, we're, we're seeing this energy monitoring continuing to pick up uh, for, for everyone to understand what their loads are doing. Uh, could be in older panels. Uh, so, so, right, the requirement is going to be very similar or, or provides us that what's the fill, right? Not more than 75% fill in, in, the, in the gutter space, right, with regard to where those CTs go. And so, you know, thinking about and, and doing a, a quick evaluation if you're putting these in older panels is how are they filled already, right? If I'm going to specify these things, uh, into the whole building and I have a, a structure that's existing, do I have the room in those older panels, right, that may not have the gutter space uh, that, that were pre-existing to the 80s when we, when we increased the size of all the gray boxes, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, they need to really be understanding what, what, what they can do and how they can put those in so that they can comply with this new requirement that, that establishes that 40% fill with the wire, 75% mm -hmm. maximum with the CTs in that cross-sectional area. Yeah, I think it's important to note that it is limited to power monitoring equipment. Uh, when we start looking at energy management equipment, there are more safety aspects that need to be covered for the product that it's going to be installed in, such as the short circuit current rating, uh, heat rise, and other. So this is really limited to power monitoring equipment. 
but still uh, something that's been drastically needed in the code as, as we struggle with the compliance of how you install this in the field. Absolutely. Speaking of short circuit current, Jim, Article 409. Well, we have Articles 409.22 and Article 620.16 that are adding uh, requirements for short circuit current ratings. Um, the, the newest requirement is for elevators, and elevators uh, have particular challenges uh, in the industry due to the limitations by the elevator manufacturers on short circuit current ratings. Uh, most of the product that's available in the country is only rated for five or 10,000 amps. And uh, where do you use elevators? In, in large buildings that have fault currents that are way above five or 10,000 amps. So, so we've got a challenge here from an engineering perspective uh, in how to limit that fault current uh, to an elevator control panel. Uh, and it's tough, uh, you know, you can look at uh, trying to reconfigure your distribution system with individual feeders to elevator controllers. You might joke and route the circuit around the building, but that doesn't <laughs> usually work so well. <laughs> um, isolation transformers might be another possibility, um, but there's some, there's some real issues here. Um, uh, you can look at fuse protection, and, but if you're gonna do that, you need to take a look at the up over down method and whether or not that meets UL uh, 508A, so. Uh, I think that this is one of the, the newest challenge points and, and that's going to require some engineering attention uh, with, the, with the new code. So Jim, one of the challenges with this is that you end up with a lot of field certification of product, right, for higher fault current ratings? Well, if, if you can't get the elevator manufacturers to put a label on their controller that's higher than that, you know, you're limited to either limiting the fault current or trying to almost do their work for them and have, going out to the field and having uh, an independent inspection agency do the same type of thing that the elevator controller manufacturer could do. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move to questions. Chad, you must have struck a nerve with performance testing. Uh, Here's one. Could this be achieved by simulation at the manufacturer's end or at the factory? So, if not, why? Okay, so the NEC really sort of recognized that there were multiple methods and, and the manufacturers certainly test the products before they leave. But it, the code is re requirement 23095C is really clear that this has to be done after installed on site. And usually that's because there can be interconnections that have to be made in the field by the electrical contractor. And we see cases where those connections um, don't get made. Right, it, it could just be something that where the wire was coiled up and it was just an oversight, it didn't get plugged together. Um, it also eliminates any cases where you might have uh, CT polarities crossed and those type of issues. So certainly in the factory, uh, the configurations are primary current injected tested, but in the field, this is really where the new requirement comes. And, and so it'll be done in both, I guess is the answer to your question, Wendell. It will be done in the factory and it needs to be done after installation. Jim, you too have struck a nerve saying, finally, help us to coordinate and enforce control panel ratings. You mentioned UL 508A in that elevator example. Are there others out there that we should help with? Well, I think it's, as I said, with the elevator controllers, there's, there's a problem across the industry right now with, with this labeling. And um, everybody's kind of waking up to it. The, some people have actually responded very well. The, uh, for, for example, chiller manufacturers in the control panels mm -hmm. will list their chiller controllers up to 100,000 amps if, it's, if there's a few switch in front of it. Um, but there's a lot of other UL508 shops out there that are putting panels together for all kinds of in industry reasons and, and they're going with these lower short circuit current ratings and it's a challenge to the engineering community to get their system down to those, those ratings. Mm. So you must have not, Alan, challenged them because here's another one for Chad. Around the wiring, <laughs> around the wiring, does power monitoring additions to existing equipment, will, will it manage in regards to marginal limitations such as temperature rise, fill, and et cetera? Again, the, the code requirement that you maintain the 75% fill within the cross-sectional area addresses your heat rise concern. That's the way the products were heat rise tested. So as long as you follow the code requirements with that fill rating for the cross-sectional area, uh, you will be in compliance. 
Excellent. Let's return to articles and changes in the National Electric Code. How about 70.3? Uh, 700.3 F. Uh, this is one of the uh, new ones that ha that's not really an expansion of what's been in the code before. But the, there is now a requirement for specific means to connect a temporary source of power when the emergency source is undergoing service or repair. If, if you look at this, there's a lot of 24-7 facilities out uh, there that uh, don't really ever shut down, but do have a requirement for an emergency generator. And that emergency generator has to have the oil changed once a year. So what are you going to do during that time? Okay. And so the uh, code making panel 13 added these re this requirement for uh, permanent connection uh, provisions for a temporary source of power. And uh, they recognize that not every facility is going to require this. Um, certainly if you're in a four-story office building and, and you know, nobody's in the building on New Year's Eve, you can shut the building down and not need this type of a, of a permanent connection. So uh, I think that certain aspects of this code are going to evolve as time goes on, but uh, the intent is clear in that if we have a critical facility and it needs an emergency generator, that type of power needs to be available while the generator is being maintained if the building's occupied or the emergency system can be expected to be called upon. And, and this one may play over right to NFPA 110, right, for the emergency power systems requirements for the maintenance aspects and, and, and tying into that. So we may see this may, this may tie uh, some revisions to that. NFPA 99, right, the electrical systems for health care. Yep. Uh, yeah. I think it would be, uh, you know, it, it won't be unlikely that we see some tie across with regard to which ones have to have this backup versus maybe not all of them. Yeah, uh, but, uh, yeah. but certainly a small nursing home is going to need something like this yeah. because we're just going to have the single generator. A large hospital will have two, three, four generators, and certainly, and they can use you know one of the other generators as the emergency source of power while one's being maintained. There's usually a redundancy there. So, and some other aspects of this code change, it allows them to use this temporary generator connection for things like a load bank. Sure. Alan sure. mentioned 110 where you have yearly testing of the generator mm -hmm. with a load bank. So you can solve that as well. The other thing that could make in panel 13 since Jim and I are on it, what they were after is that there's no disturbance of the permanent system wiring to connect a temporary generator. That was always sort of implied, but never actually in, in clear requirement language. And we have that now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what we were being told was that, and, and what we know, of course, is, is that when uh, they come out to do maintenance on a permanent generator, they often bring a temporary generator with them to, to address this. Well, that required um, disconnecting uh, the permanent generator lugs and reconnecting up the temporary generator, and those lugs get worn out, they bust, and, and then they fail three months later or something. So uh, there's, this is a good addition to the code and should help solve some, some problems out there. All right. Moving along. Jim, what about surge protection? Well, we're seeing uh, several articles in the code that uh, are adding surge protection, and uh, it certainly applies to elevators now and, uh, and some of the other areas. Uh, it's part of a trend. You know, I think uh, sur surge protection started with uh, uh, an addition on emergency systems mm -hmm. uh, in the last cycle, and, yes. and they added it to... Uh, emergency panel boards and and this this of course made sense too because there's a lot of uh, you know solid state wiring in buildings now with LED light fixture and so forth um, there's uh, power disturbances that can create surges and and you know more and more systems are in need of this type of surge protection uh, article 645.18 data centers is is also a new requirement uh, for for surge protection so any of those critical operations areas for emergency systems or critical operations data systems, they warrant that extra protection. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, and there's probably some other areas that uh, that it could be added to the code. We might see more of it in healthcare under certain uh, certain systems. And uh... okay, good discussion on surge. Surge is going to be everywhere. We need to be able to help the electrical systems, and putting surge on seems to be the seems to be the right thing. Along with that, thinking ahead of around safety and, and risk, Alan, could you tell us a little bit more about service panels and, and some of the things that are changing there in 408.3? All right, 
is really an expansion of some existing language. So today, right, 408, uh, 408.3 has requirements for barriers for switchboards and switchgear right. for incidental contact, uh, right? And, and so th this change was pretty simple, but it has big implications is, is we simply added the word panel boards to that list. So, so now those lugs uh, at the at the top of panel boards that are served uh, that are that are acting as service equipment, whether that's in your in your house, or whether that's uh, a much larger panel uh, panel board ser serving as a service panel, we now have to have some kind of provisions that protect us against in incidental contact or some kind of barrier, uh, for instance, right? So. Uh, you'll see different, I think you'll see different things come out of this. One of the things I think that drove this is, is folks uh, uh, along the northern borders, I think, saw some of the Canadian panels with the, with the steel barriers uh, because of the, 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 the construction requirements in Canada having a, a, service, pan, a service box and, and then a disconnect, right? And so this kind of grew out of that. Uh, that seems like a good idea. Unfortunately, you can't move conductors out the top of the box with a steel barrier in place. You could only go one way. So uh, the manufacturers, I think, got innovative. And, and in particular, uh, you, you can see these, these pretty simple barriers to make sure that the conductors come in. And as long as those conductors are, are stripped at the right length, uh, these are very, very simple uh, rubber barriers uh, that set around those conductors and those lugs so that there's no incidental contact. Now, keep in mind, this isn't... This isn't a license to work live, right? I mean, uh, for us to pop these open anymore. Uh, they're not protecting us from, from that or even an arcing condition, right, that would, I think we talked about earlier, right, that arcing condition can, the ionized gases can come across and bridge the line side and, and create a bigger flash from, from a protection ahead of it, uh, which would be, you'd be looking at the service over current device uh, trying to protect you, right? So by no means is this a uh, force to get in there and work these panels live at all. But I think they are a great addition for incidental contact. Uh, if someone's in there doing troubleshooting or something where they're permitted to do uh, that, that, that live, I'll call it live work, but in there looking at it. But we don't want these to be an excuse not to, not to turn the power off and, and not to make sure that we're working this equipment uh, in a safe condition. Yeah. That, that line to load side arcing fault has been a theme today because we've talked about it on the service panels, the 1200 amp fuse switch, and here again on, on these panel boards. So something to be aware of. It's important to note that this requirement applies for panel boards with a single main. Um, so if we look at six circuit main panel boards or main lug panel boards, you don't have the same requirement here because you'll have an upstream device or the barrier then doesn't necessarily provide you any protection against electric shock. So that's mm -hmm. really what this barrier is intended to do, is provide you a degree of protection against electrical shock. And as Alan said, and as Jim said, a barrier in an arc flash event where you contain pressure, a lot of times, quite frankly, can just become shrapnel, mm -hmm. right? So right. <laughs> um, it's there for a, an important reason, but it, it, is, it is limited to electric shock protection. And, and again, it's part of a, uh, an overall protection enhancement. It's probably the biggest one word code change of 2017, <laughs> right? So one word in a code section change. So this also would apply to any of the configurations where you, know, you have a backfed single main for a panel board, right? So there are barrier kits from your manufacturer for all of these different configurations. Uh, most manufacturers, these kits are field retrofitable. So if you've got existing yep. panels and you want to get these kits, uh, you can do that and install them. Absolutely. Almer told us about changes or trends in the industry about distributed systems. Article 705 seems to ten, uh, tend to help us better understand that. Jim, do you have? Um, yeah, is this one yours? Oh, sorry, <laughs> 705. So 705 is where we cover interconnection of power systems, right? And so we've had existing requirements for where you connect a utility interactive inverter, say from solar or wind or some other renewable, and you connect it on the load side of the service. So how you do that safely has been really sort of spelled out in the code. Um, when it gets to panel boards, there are limitations based on the bus size in the panel board and then the location of that overcurrent device for your, your inverter output, whether that's uh, any type of utility interactive inverter. Uh, so you have a specific location, and that location has been specified the opposite end mm -hmm. from the main breaker. 
So we've always had this issue with what do you do with center fed, center main breaker panels? And what we found across the country is that some jurisdictions allowed it, some jurisdictions prohibited it, and, and not consistent. it just wasn't consistent. Um, and so it was really a sort of a, a difficult situation because the replacement of the service panel sometimes was cost prohibitive of the, the solar renewables going in solved. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that would prevent the entire project, right? So I think this is one of the best things that the code has done to address this issue and really sort of aligns. It allows you to install this inverter uh, overcurrent device at either end, but not both ends within the panel board that's center fed. And I know the code panel rights have, have looked at this one pretty extensively to make sure that we're creating a safety issue, right? I think when they when they looked at both ends, uh, when they put that in, it was a very conservative approach uh, as they as they looked at that calculation. And, and I think they, they did a good job of looking at this one as well to, to understand what does that load do? What does that, what does that alternate source uh, due to, to the potential safety of, of supplying more power to that bus structure than should be, you know, than potentially it should be on there. And so I still think 120% here rule is, is pretty conservative with regard to what, what's permitted there, and, and I think the panel did a good job of, of looking at that. You have to look at uh, the magnitude of your alternate power source, the magnitude of your source, and the magnitude of your load, and and which way the current's flowing in those yep. along those bus bars to actually understand the intent of this article and uh, and what what the uh, what requires analysis and what the risks are. Yes, that's great. So let's go to some questions. There are many questions coming in. Uh, this question, Article Seven Hundred Three. Does this mean that we should plan on installing generator tap boxes for those applications that require this level of redundancy? Well, I don't think generator tap boxes are the intent of uh, this addition to the code. Um, really what we're looking for is, uh, is what was shown in uh, the figure that associates the code article, which is um, some interlocked switches that allow, uh, you know, a a, a, trans, a manual transfer between the permanent source and the, uh, the temporary alternate source. Uh, if you put a generator tap box in, that implies to me anyway that you're just trying to interconnect the generator with the, uh, the uh, temporary generator and, and without that switching means there's no uh, way to guarantee that the temporary generator wouldn't come on and backfeed the mm -hmm. very generator you're trying to maintain. So we could put in two breakers potentially and have a Kirk key system. Yeah, that's yes. right. Construction that's, that's, and that's, put that's, a tap box that's out. The kind of a yeah. solution. That's right. That's right. And, and the tap box uh, configuration can be extended so that you have uh, a load bank connection and a temporary generator connection outside as well. So, so I, I guess the the intent here, uh, um, Wendell, is that this temporary emergency generator serve the emergency ATS or transfer switch, that it's available to provide emergency power if called on under any normal circumstance, mm -hmm. just like the emergency generator. So if you've got that interlocking in place, um, then you've meet, met the intent there. Yeah, then the temporary is doing the same function as the emergency. Yeah. Good understanding. How about in primary injection testing? This one comes up all the time in that how, uh, and we've done it, we need to do it at commissioning, but how about old switch gear? Old switch gear. So I think that um, you would look and see if there's any refurbishment activities, um, but typically if this has been prior tested and evaluated, there's no protocol for, for, for having to go back in and retest that, that connection. Now certainly if there's been any reconfiguration of the system, there's been any changes in feed direction, addition of sources, um, any places where you might have inadvertently introduced a neutral to ground bond uh, that wasn't in the system before, then you should look at retesting. Great, good to know. We weren't able to get, all, get to all of your questions today, but don't worry, we'll provide answers to your questions after this broadcast and we'll communicate to all of you. We will post the question and answer, the PowerPoint, along with additional code resources and a summary of this broadcast on our portal. As a reminder, you must join the portal to retrieve your certificate for PDH credit. In addition, all of these great code resources we build into this portal based on your feedback to us over the years, and we will continue to improve it. 
Also, please go and complete the survey and give us your feedback. I want to thank the team here in Nashville today for addressing these important changes to the National Electric Code. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Chad. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for joining us online today. Be sure to join our next webinar series on March 30th regarding power quality. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.